how is it that you can think of uh, that you must have an enemy to think of uh, your your own security? Actually, this is a very unnatural way of thinking for for many people around the world. I mean, to this day, China does not talk about the U.S. as the enemy. You don't hear mm-hmm. that. It isn't. China does not have enemies. ASEAN does not have enemies. You have countries that have, you know, behavior that you might not agree with at a particular time, but until the shooting starts, it's not the enemy. That blanket way of, uh, there, there's, there's just no need in their, uh, in their worldview and in their way of discussing things to think of it like that. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm hosting a panel with three colleagues from Africa and Eurasia to discuss the West's addiction to what they call deterrence, but that time and again has taken the form of aggression, attack and regime change operations. Why can't the West overcome its deadly love for belligerence? To discuss this, I've got with me Dr. Agogo Apkome, a Professor at South Af- at the South African University of Zululand, Dr. Jan Oberg, a peace researcher at the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research in Sweden, and Dr. John Peng, a senior research fellow at the Perak Academy, a think tank in Malaysia. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Great pleasure. Well, fantastic to have you all here on this panel. This is something that um, we discussed a little bit last time in a, in a talk, like Jan and I, and maybe Jan, can I ask you, um, you made the argument beautifully last time why deterrence, especially offensive deterrence, is such a folly as a security strategy. Could you get us started by laying that out again? And then I'll ask uh, Agogo and Sean to react to that. I shall try. Thank you very much. Uh for having this discussion. Nobody, as far as I know, has had it before about the basics of security and particularly of NATO's philosophy. Uh, Deterrence is something we know uh, kind of philosophically and theoretically from the field of law, because laws are supposed by promising punishment to deter us from doing criminal things. So in a way, you can say there's nothing wrong as such in deterrence. It's the way it's interpreted by the military. And what what my problem with it is, and I've talked about these things for more than 30 years, is that the, the philosophy of NATO and all basically Western countries, in contrast to, for instance, China, is that we argue for it being necessary to be able to have the capacity to kill you far away, like, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles um, or nuclear weapons, which nobody wants to use on their own territory, but just far away on somebody else. And that signals by definition that Oh, maybe we don't see you as an enemy as such, but we want to be sure that if you become an enemy, then we can kill you where you are on the other side of the globe with precision guided um, missiles and munitions, etc. Now, if you look at that from the other side and use some empathy, then it's obvious that that is seen as a very unfriendly thing to do by the other side. Oh, you're a, you, you want to be able to kill me? So uh, that elicits the response that, oh, if you have those long range missiles by which or whatever it is, conventional or nuclear, if you have those that can reach us far away from you, then we also need to have something that we can threaten or deter you with. And that is a completely 110% guarantee of an arms race. Both parties or all parties would always say, yeah, we have the capacities, but we don't have the intention to do these things. Now, how credible is that? Because the world could change tomorrow and you might get those atten- that those intentions or your government may change and we get some new people and they might have those intentions. What you're signaling by offensive, and by offensive I mean those which are not for self-defense but for deterrence far away, 
that by that we are getting an arms race, we're getting insecurity, we're getting instability, we're getting the military, industrial, media, academic complex mimic. And that's why it's a perpetual mobile. There is no way you can stop this because the other side, each side, other side, will always have the argument that you're threatening me with your long range stuff. And therefore, I have to threaten you back. And so we need to change that philosophy. If we want to do deterrence at all, we must have defensive deterrence. That That is basically the argument I gave you last. And thank you for, for laying that out again. Uh, Agogo and John, um, you're, you're watching the Europeans from two different places, right? From the very tip of, of, of Africa and then uh, John, like from China and, 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 and Malaysia, right? Uh, where do you think is this very, to me, extremely European and Euro-Atlantic uh, obsession with deterrence coming from? Maybe I'll go, go first and then John. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Pascal. And thanks, Jan, for that intro. Uh, I'll respond first to one of the earliest words that Jan uses, and that's philosophy. So the, the philosophy, the Western obsession with armament, with long range deterrence, in my view, arises from the philosophy that is cemented by a history of aggression. I do not think it is inspired by the need to deter or the need to prevent being attacked, it is inspired by the very fact that Europe's even ancient history and modern history, the American ancient and modern history is one that is replete with acts of aggression by states that have global dominant power. And I think they know, those who operate the system understand full well that without projecting that power and without being ready to use and without using that power, they would not be in the positions of dominance that they are in today. And they believe in a very, in a very sick way, I think they are right. They believe that to continue to dominate, they do need that power. So I think the use of the word deterrence is, uh, is, is, is a clever ploy to mask the actual intention, the actual operation of these armaments. Uh, it, it is a way to sell one to the European publics because they, because we, we believe that there's democracy and everything that it's done for, for the sake of the state. And also to sell to the people of the world that, oh, this is why we are doing it. It's to conceal the actual mindset of aggression, the, prepare, the preparedness for aggression, uh, which they understand has been the basis of their dominance for the past couple of centuries. John, how do you see it? Um, first, thank you for um, bringing me into this uh, conversation uh, with these two great gentlemen. Um, I um, it's uh, I like the way the the conversation has begun uh, with Jan speaking about this concept of uh, offensive uh, deterrence at the bottom of it, and uh, go go uh, on your prompting, uh, Pascal. Um, uh, looking back into the philosophical. Um, uh, premises behind this, uh, the the actual world worldview that that motivates this, I I think there are several. If you ask the question, and and this is a I mean a tough question and an important one, where does this worldview come from? Um, in, in fact, even to ask that question is to kind of uh, stand back and and refuse to uh, to to naturalize it. Uh, because this is a worldview that has been naturalized. I mean, you know, in international relations, for example, realist theory uh, embeds this, this um, what I would call an ontology of violence. That is that, you know, it's almost like a Hobbesian state of nature, uh, you know, uh, in, in which, uh, you know, man is beast to man and, and nations would, would be beast to nations uh, if there wasn't a, a, a leviathan, a single um, sort of power over them, uh, uh, a kind of hegemony. So this 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 assumption uh, is is absolutely naturalized by the West. It's as if there's no other no other way. But uh, it's important to stress that this is not the only way of looking at the world, and it's indeed not the way that people elsewhere look at it. It's certainly not the Chinese uh, uh, view of 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 uh, neither the moral universe nor the um, or, or the international. Um, system. So, 
you know, someone like Mearsheimer, for example, would say, if we, we are in a state of anarchy and therefore the only thing ultimately keeping the peace is a balance of, of, of violence, a balance of the threat to violence, which in, in other words is, is, is deterrence. There's the other aspect of this as well and how we got to this place is colonial history. And again, Agogo pointed this out. Um, you know, there's something really self-serving in this notion because they keep using the term deterrence when what they're actually doing is expansionism and um, uh, and, and, and imperial designs and imperial uh, um, expansion uh, is cloaked, is veiled under this um, this this concept. NATO expansion, right? For example, so so the expansion of this. Uh, system of the West, uh, you know, is taken as something natural, is taken as something you couldn't possibly object to, but it's extremely threatening to other nations to the point of war. So I, I like the way in which this conversation is going. And I think re really this is about, the, the question in the end is one of world order. But the question of world order is uh, about what kind of system of how you organize uh, relations among states how they view one another. So, so I, this is a very promising beginning to this to this conversation. And Thank we you. have to come back to this issue of colonialism and the the way that the global south is also now looking at what's happening. But before we do that, I do want to point out, and maybe this will go to Jan. We had a different moment in Europe. The 1975, uh, the, the Helsinki, the the final act of the. Um, of the Conference for Security and Cooperation, that was a moment when like 50 states signed up to a cooperative framework. And then even in 1990, with the Paris final, final communique of the CSE, uh, there it was it was enshrined, you know, uh, security can only happen if everybody is secure, right? Uh, security cannot come at the expense of somebody. And in a sense, that's, a, that's the opposite of deterrence, right? That's the recognition that the other one is part of the of the balance. Jan, where where did that one come from, that recognition at the time between 75 and 90, and where did it go? I think it came very much from the fact that at that time you had statesmen who could think <laughs> and who knew theories and who some of them wrote good books, which I cannot imagine any of the present European leaders do. Uh, the, the, I don't think we should say that there was not a thinking based on deterrence at that time, but you had the Ostpolitik by, by Willy Brandt. You had, as you say, very, very importantly, the OSCE, which was a construction basically of neutral countries and spearheaded by President Kekkonen of Finland at the time. And by the way, it's very sad to see that Finland is, is today a totally black and white country as a NATO member because the, 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 the beautiful thing of, of Finland at that time was that if you ask the Finnish people, they saw no enemies in the East and no enemies in the West. West. They were neutral. So was Sweden, which always belonged to the West, but had a commission by Olof Palme about what you also hinted at, the common security. The idea that I can only be secure if the other side feels secure with me. Now, it's a banal way of thinking. It's normal human empathy. But it was an extraordinary step in the right direction by statesmen, by a statesman, a, a leader of a, of, of a neutral state to produce that report. And which, which actually at the time was based also in a social democratic thinking and to some extent on the idea that perhaps we should go for defensive defense. Uh, and so I think that, that the, the different activities under the OSCE, discussion of human rights, visiting each other's military exercises, etc., were a, a recognition that deterrence, it was not expressed that way, but it was a, a subdued um, recognition that deterrence could be dangerous and could lead to spiraling arms races and better that we talk with each other. Uh, it did not mean that we had the same philosophy. And there were at the time, as you know, there were two blocks. There was the Warsaw Pact at that time vis-a-vis uh, -vis NATO. 
Um, the Warsaw Pact, by the way, created way after NATO, where <laughs> NATO usually says that we created NATO because there was a Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. That's a historic lie. But the long story short is that that was a recognition and awareness that that philosophy was dangerous and arms races were dangerous. And we wanted a Europe where we would not have the war that might be desirable from from Moscow's point of view and Moscow's po uh, Washington's point of view. And that's where we are today, because we have forgotten completely about confidence building measures, which was the catchwords of the OSCE. Talk with each other. Be sure that exercises do not run out of hand and become warfare misunderstood on the other side and all these very, very good things. It's all gone today. We have basically no contacts with the other side at the moment. It is a very dangerous situation. And a very, you just let me end this by saying this. You mentioned, or somebody mentioned, the, the balance of violence. And some would say the balance of power. Some would say the balance of deterrence, uh, of, de of, of terrorism. Also, you know, we talked about nuclear weapons. We had the term balance of terror. Now, Nobody is associating terror anymore with nuclear weapons. It's it's what what you know HTS is doing in Syria at the moment, right? Very tragically. Uh, long story short, that balance was much more balanced in the seventies and eighties that you refer to, because the Warsaw Pact was something like 75 percent of NATO's military expenditures. Today, you have had a long period since the breakdown of the of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, in which the military expenditures of Russia has been about, you know, what is it, 8 10 percent of NATO's. And so the idea that balance was something that would be stabilizing has become completely thrown out of the window. And we have a Western world who thinks that dominance superiority and all that is something because, you know, they want this one polar dominant system is the only thing that works. Whereas I would say, let's have back the balance between the forces. That is a more secure strategy. And it, I think it's it's very tragic that we are in a situation new that all the things we did right in the 70s and 80s, and we avoided confrontation, and we did get rid of the intermediate um, uh, distance missiles, the INF Treaty, etc. All that has been thrown out now from the thinking, because there is no thinking anymore. There's no intellectuals among European leaders anymore. Uh, Sorry to say so. I, I agree. I agree. I think we're going through a crisis of intellect, actually, in, in Europe. And Agogo, like looking at this from Africa and and, uh, and also like taking into consideration that the African continent now has been you know, some parts have been decolonized to a good bit. Other parts are still semi-colonized or neo-colonized. But, you know, the African continent, the, the 50 or so states on the African continent have been able to have their own relationships with each other and have done surprisingly little war. I mean, the, the mass violence in Africa happens usually inside the state, but not among the states. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what you think, what also Africa teaches us in about international relations and this idea of deterrence? Thank you. And um, yeah, maybe it's just how the conversation is structured, but I have no problem with that. I don't mind responding to Jan. He makes very interesting points that I'm compelled to respond to. <laughs> so I I'd like to respond to what um, what both of you said, actually, about the period where, if you like, there was a de-escalation. Uh, I think um, I do not pretend to be an international relations expert. Um, neither am I an expert in European global north relations. Neither do I wish to be, um, actually, at this moment, maybe in my next life, perhaps. Um, but one can infer from an African point of view that that period that Yan talks about, I think it coheres perhaps, maybe begins from something Jeffrey Sachs speaks about a lot, about um, JFK's time as president and his push, a uh, very intellectual, moral push for, for, for de-escalation. One can understand that from an African point of view as a response to the realization that the Anglo-American psyche, Anglo-American supremacist psyche, especially following the World War II, 
had brought the threat of supremacy home to Europe, to the global north. And so, and I think we're coming to that realization now, especially with the Ukraine situation. Um, from the point of view of Africa, I don't think Africans felt that. And when historically, when, when the Europeans talk about respecting the other, it's doubtful that even now, that in the core psyche of the champions, the, the leaders of uh, Anglo-American establishment, that the non-European is even up to the stature of the other, deserves that kind of recognition. And if that recognition is not there, I think this happened, I'm trying to interpret Yan now, I think these things happened and Sachs and JFK, because the global North self realized that he was threatened by the other global, the global North other. And that required self-reexamination. It didn't happen before then. And of course, we know that at that time, the Soviet Union was not as weak as it became. It didn't collapse. And in the, in the post-90s, post-Fukuyama years, um, the, 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 the opportunity for supremacy, uh, get, it was open season for supremacy. So that's the way I would understand that. And again, uh, I think it's important in these conversations. It's my firm view and that of several scholars and several commentators that colonization is still on. Um, I don't think we have reached the point where we say decolonized or even post-colonized. Uh, it is still on. Um, uh, the African continent still responds primarily, and not just the African continent, many global South con uh, countries still respond primary primarily to guns pointed at their faces for every single international matter that's been discussed. Uh, and that gun could come in the form of a tweet from the president-elect of the US, uh, we are going to sanction. Sanctions cannot work without military force. They all backed up by bombs. Everything the West has done in its relations to the non-West has been backed up by bombs, except now they are being faced with China. And that's why the South China Sea is being militarized is, and China is being surrounded to remind you that we've got a bomb here, we've got a bullet here. So back to, to Pascal's question, I'm sorry if this is a bit roundabout. I do not think the African experience has necessitated and the African worldview and, and African history uh, has necessitated this approach to militarization. Uh, because a people will respond not only to their cosmologies, they will act according to their cosmologies and their worldviews, to their aspirations and their realities. Uh, I have never felt that as a Nigerian, I was under threat of Cameroonian aggression. Cameroonian is the Nigerian Cameroon is a Nigerian country uh, to our west, no Benin Republic aggression, no Niger Republic aggression from the north. And I have never felt expressed by any political, social thought leaders in my home country, and even here in South Africa, of the need to demonstrate superiority over some other African country, or to even demonstrate hegemony over all of Africa. One has never felt that, so I do not think I think it's natural. It follows then that uh, that kind of militarization uh, um, could not have arisen in this context, because I believe these theories and these ideas they respond, they respond to people's cosmologies, people's experiences, and of course, embedded in people's cosmologies is their aspirations, is their self projections. It has always, in our lifetimes at least, or in the history that we have studied. One constant source of the projection of dominance, of global dominance, has come from the Anglo-American North. And it is not surprising, therefore, I think, that they would constitute their understanding of, 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 of security in terms of dominance and violence and deterrence so so um, uh, described. Remember that we have said, my firm view is that they don't mean deterrence. And I think it's yeah, John who used the word. They actually mean expansion and dominance. And um, deterrence is just a, a, smoke, a smoke screen. It's just an alibi um, 
uh, they choose these terms the way they like, you know. Uh, if you let me say this last before I leave, the, before I yield the mic, uh, we know what happened in Syria the other day. All of a sudden, those whom they called terrorists the day before are now called rebels and opposition. <laughs> they use the terms, so they will deploy the terms when it fits a particular intention and strategy. And these terms are necessary to hide from the public, but first, they are local publics, they are local populations and then a more global population, what all this is about. Thank you. That's why we have to cut through the the rhetoric, right? And through the propaganda in order to get to the hard core of this problem. And uh, John, you used uh, ontology of violence uh, uh, and the, this projection, right? I feel that there's so much projecting coming from the global north. And I explicitly mean the northwest <laughs> of the global north that projects its own, its own interpretation of the world on everybody else and then expects China to react like that. And from the east and southeast Asia... Um, what would you say what the actual way is that 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 the world is conceptualized or the international world is conceptualized? Is it also uh, in the, in this framework of deterrence? Um, certainly not. Um, whether from Southeast Asia or from China, there is a great awareness. Uh, and, you know, there's a shared uh, perspective to what Hagogo just um, uh, outlined. That is that the global South views the world in this way and understands the world, uh, you know, existing world order, the so-called rules-based international order, in this fashion. Now, um, and and he's 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 sort of laid it out very very well uh, about the continuation of 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 this colonial dominance, and it's an ongoing thing. It's also uh, seen as a, I think, the projection of European experience, not just of their worldview, but the, of their experience of an extraordinarily violent um, subcontinent uh, in world historical terms. There is really nothing like it. If you just track it statistically or you chart it, Europe's uh, wars are off the charts compared to the rest of the world, actually, in uh, over the last three, 400 years. And there's something about the way it's organized right, that uh, leads to this. And now it continues to project this. Um, but I, I think we, regardless of all this, it doesn't work anymore. I think that the understanding now, the realization, because we've seen a lot of growth, I, I want to bring it back to this notion of what the Chinese call changes unseen in a century. It just doesn't work anymore. The system of, of um, you know, uh, this conception of the world and this uh, understanding of the way in which you organize world order that's premised on 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 this balance of of terror or balance of violence or deterrence offensive deterrence if you will because you have the rise of the of the emerging economies not just china this is an unstoppable historical trend as the chinese like to say so we're at this great crossroads it really is the end of that order um, you know, matters of justice aside, and there are some who might pragmatically want to stick with it and say, look, uh, at least it keeps a certain kind of order. And maybe certain states might benefit from this, certain uh, global south, the formerly global south states, if you will, right, benefit from certain ad advantages, positions in this. But it just doesn't hold together anymore. And now the, the issue before us is what do we what do we do? Do you try to to sort of uh, you know pull back the the, the tide, uh, and and that's what I see a lot of Western policy is now. In fact, that's what is particularly dangerous is that the world is in many respects already multipolar, particularly in the economic order and in trade, right? Global South to global South trade exceeds that of the West. You you can't even sanction, uh, you know, you sanctions merely um, isolate. Uh, the West, and then you lead to sort of this leads to increasing desperation because these measures don't work. It leads to deindustrialization. So this 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 has to to end. And so in this in this respect, I mean, China has put forward a global security initiative. It's put forward something concrete, which I think embeds uh, the worldview and the ideas behind it. That is that it sees world order as just like domestic order as something that you need to construct that you construct with the same civilized ideas of creating common interest, for example, 
Um, so, so this global security initiative will be would be part of a, of uh, you know the Chinese conception of a community of a shared future for humankind. And then under that, you have a global development initiative, which they first articulated, I think about 2019, then followed by a uh, global security initiative, and then a global civilization initiative. All these are needed to create a, a, a common world, because to, to fail to do that would be to leave the world as a, as a literally a kind of a jungle of perpetual violence. Uh, which we, we've already spoken about. So I think those that that effort is worth looking at, and it's not certainly not a block from again from the Southeast Asian perspective. This kind of thing is precisely what we've been trying to do, <clears throat> um, starting with the Afro Asian Conference, right, the Bandung Conference of 1955. So that you know, and and that you know, which, which we have an anniversary for next next year, right? Important anniversary for. So a kind of a shared interest with a, a shared vision and aspiration with, with, with Africa um, for a different kind of world order. And one in which, which specifically eschews the types of alliances based on enmity with a third party, right? Based on deterring somebody else. There's always a kind of, well, you know, in, in European notions of an alliance, there's China in mind. Uh, we know talking about multilateralism, US multilateral efforts in Africa, for example, in 2014 and 2022, they had US-Africa summits. This is really typical of, 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 their, uh, of their initiatives and their behavior. And then it soon becomes clear that this is in order to counter China. Why can't you be interested in Africa for the sake of Africa? <laughs> it's it's a gigantic kind of continent, right? The cradle of humanity. Why why can't you, uh, you know, why can't you regard them in their own right? The same thing. They come to Southeast Asia, and that's the only interest. This is not only demeaning. Everyone understands this leads to conflict, or this is the you know you're just embedding conflict conflictual relationships into the system. Hmm. And, and, and we can we need to do better than that. I mean, the stakes are really, really high. This I mean. is the core of the problem. And Jan, you already laid it out in the beginning, but in the way that international relations in the West, the global north, is is conceptualized, the need for an enemy is always there, right? Just as with deterrence, yeah. just as deterrence always expects that so there's something to be deterred, the idea NATO itself needs Russia, it needs China, the significant <laughs> other. Um, can the Europeans, can, can, can the global North overcome this? Or what should the global, what should the thinking part of the world, the not dumb part of the world do in order to deal with this obsession with creating their own enemies to uh, to justify their existence <laughs> sorry <laughs> jan <laughs> and then <laughs> that's that's a nice little one <laughs> yeah, it's the easy, the easy I, 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 let me first that's say well the deterrence theory is based on the idea that somebody is at least potentially or perhaps de facto an enemy secondly i believe that when you see yourself as number one you don't learn, you teach. Mm -hmm. If you're number 10 in a system, you have nine others to learn from. How did they climb and do things better than I did? Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, what the Western world now is facing. We have not learned anything in the last many decades, and others are learning fast and doing things differently from us. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's one thing perhaps we should touch upon, uh, and I'm no expert on it, but I think this idea of enemies is a little bit related to the idea of Christian missionary thinking. They have to be like us. Uh, unity in uniformity. Open up China in the 70s and it will become like us. And that is a terrible mistake. The only unity that is interesting in is unity in diversity and difference. Mm -hmm. So uh, this it, it, trying to make others be like us is a very Western thing that, if you will, the Chinese don't have. The Chinese and the Japanese, by the way, where you sit, Pascal, are very happy of being special. They don't want everybody else to be like them. And they don't sell their social system or their ways of thinking 
you know, China is not trying to make people Confucianists or Buddhists or anything like that, or one party states uh, all over the place. But we have this, I would call it a disease that we think that we are so great that whatever we do in the West, it should be universalized. And the others should be like us. You know, that was also built into the idea of the first world, second world, third world and fourth world, that they would go up, you know, trickle down some values and economies and trickle up uh, ways of thinking so that they would be like us. And that, of course, this idea of universalizing, I've always been against from a peace point of view, even if it was Gandhian thinking would be the only one, if anything, that could be universalized because it doesn't hurt anybody else. But when you have this mission idea that somebody must be like us, and if they don't do it with the Bible, then we do it with a sword. Uh, is a way of creating enemies. And we're back to one thing that is very clear. And I noticed that as a young student in the 70s, there was a brilliant German uh, scholar whose name was Dieter Singhaas, who wrote um, an idea, a thick book in German about st structural uh, militarism. And one of his points were, if the Soviet Union falls into the sea tomorrow, the West will very quickly readapt, find some other enemy and continue armament because it, it cannot live without enemies. And that's, uh, you know, one of the things I have as a young student took into my thinking that all these arguments that Russia is a big threat, that China is a big threat, that God knows who is a big threat are inventions. It's kind of a necessary paranoia. It's something where you can say there's no rational analysis behind it. I mean, this so I'm 73. All the years I've been living, I've heard that the Russians are coming. I mean, you cannot even trust these damn Russians. They're not coming. They, they, they're supposed to come. They don't come. Right. So they are they, they have never invaded a neutral country and they have never invaded or tried to invade a NATO country. But still, you can make you can make NATO expansion and you can get enemies and you can you can then persuade Sweden and Finland to join. Uh, and then also, by the way, as probably some of you know, there's now 47 within one year, 47 new bilaterally decided American bases in Scandinavia. Now, this is a disease because the Russians have no designs on invading Scandinavia. But you can hear Swedish top brass say we must prepare for Putin, Putin um, uh, landing on the shores of southern Sweden and making a partial occupation of Sweden. You know, I said, what bullshit is that? Because I live here. But long story short, this cultivation of those others, the evil forces and the good forces, we being the good. I mean, this is so deep into Western cosmology, ways of thinking, that I think people who just work, you know, like peace movements, just focus basically on weapons, will not achieve anything because weapons are a production of a certain way of thinking. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into ideas that should change rather than just looking at a weapon system and say that must go or stop that war. It comes from some way of thinking, and I've tried to say some of them. Um, finally, let me just say I'm not quite sure that the deterrence thinking is just a smokescreen for what you said. It is also a smokescreen, but I think if you talk with people in uniform, they are, they are bent on. They have never been thinking of security as anything else but deterrence. That's what they teach at military academies. It's a way of practicing a profession, if you will. If somebody say, hey, why do we try, Why do we need to deter somebody else? They're not our enemies. They would not fit into that system. But it serves dominance and unipolar global dominance or what is it called? Full spectrum uh, dominance and all that. I agree with that, but I don't think it's only a substitute. I don't think it's an invention to legitimate colonialism or dominance. I think it's a way people think in the profession of the military. And I'm very happy to say that in the 80s, I wrote a book with a lieutenant colonel in Germany, Wilhelm Nolte, and a Swiss peace researcher, Dietrich Fischer. And we went through all these things, and the book was called Winning Peace, and why we needed to think radically different about what defense and security and peace is, and why we need to have a global ethics. 
because we only have a neighborhood ethics. You are not allowed to kill and you should not look at your neighbor's beautiful wife and things like that. We need a global ethics because what we do today has global consequences. And that's a whole different discussion. But we need a global and not a local ethical attitude because everything we do has uh, vibrates through the global system. And that's why these global reach weapons should they should go and we should think it differently because we have a right to self-defense but we don't have a right to kill others far away Agogo. that's article one of the un charter agogo feel free to react oh yes oh yeah thanks very much jan um let me i'm thinking of we had to get a handle on this yeah maybe let me start um with uh, your response i i do see your point in saying this is perhaps not necessarily entirely a smoke screen. But I'll tell you, maybe let me try and, and explain that a bit more. So I agree with you in principle that it could be that, it, I think what I suggest is one way of thinking about it. I cannot presume that it would be the only way of thinking about it. But if we sure. take what happened two days ago, for instance, and Pascal was reviewing Brian's brilliant, brilliant summary of what's happening in Syria. And you did that video last night, Pascal, isn't it? And at the exact same time, perhaps even now as we speak, at the exact same time that the CNN is granting an, an interview to this guy, that Al Jazeera, CNN, and all the major uh, 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 corporate Western corporate medias are calling these guys opposition and rebels, that as that organization appears on the U.S. list of terrorists, as of when Pascal was doing it last night, it was still there. So this is why I don't think it's. This is why I think th there is some there is some contrivance here. I mean, these guys, it is to reduce the cognitive ability of many of the Western thinkers to assume that they are really making a mistake about this. Mm -hmm. And when I also say it's a smoke screen, it's not necessarily all of the West, because of course we never talk of all of the West, we never talk of all of Africa anyway. I'm looking particularly at the Western establishment, the Western political establishment. I don't think they don't know. It's what I think. I think we would be insulting them and promoting ourselves to a higher level of, of, of rationality if we think they really don't know. It's, it's what I'm thinking now, be because there is a way, if, if we study, as we decolonial scholars tend to do, the colonial episteme, which is at the heart of what we call thinking that is colonial. That episteme, in my view, needs to be challenged. And I don't think Europeans have challenged that episteme yet, or sufficiently. So for instance, uh, decolonial work is, is, is focused right now on, in, as an African scholar. We are trying to speak to Africans to unshackle their thinking, to stop thinking that they are inferior, to have self-reliant epistemological um, uh, uh, ideas and processes, to unshackle themselves from, from tutelage to the West. But I think the West needs to do this. I think they absolutely need to do this themselves uh, in order to create the self-awareness that is required, especially not among the members of the, of the establishment, but among the general populace and, and among more ordinary people like us who would be able, because I've been asked one question by somebody in my household. When I make these arguments that, but Westerners don't want these wars. Now that person has asked me them, why don't they prevail on their governments? They're supposed to have democracy. And Jan, you said something similar in your last discussion. You said something, not ex those exact words. How is it that European populations are sleepwalking into a civil war? It is among that population, I think, that confusion prevails. So my, my proposition, I hope this is a bit coherent. I've got too, too many things I wanted to talk about. My, my, my suggestion is that some decolonial work, some reconsideration of the episteme, the core of Western, dominant Western ideology be done at, at, at a very, in a very systematic 
a very patient way to get people to think. Yes, there are, th there are those people in the West who will say, that's the problem. Uh, we, we feel under mm. threat uh, from, from, from Russia. We feel under threat from, from these people. That is why we want to act like that. Um, there's one more point I wanted to make about this. I, I think it was, was it John was talking about, um, or was it Ian was talking about uh, the American responses to China? So take, for instance, bring, Bring build back better. Does anybody remember that? That was a slogan that Joe Biden when he became president. Uh, it was so shamelessly an attempt to respond to the BRI. It was such a caricature. I I, I remember sitting and watching Rex Tillerson, who was uh, uh, um, Donald Trump's uh, uh, minister in visiting Nigeria, and and looking very scared. Speaking to the Nigerian pr president, you got y'all must stop taking loans from China. I said, does this guy even understand that he's making a fool of himself? Because it's so clear that there is a fear of China in terms, not a fear of physical attack, but a fear that China is getting better than them. So, so I, I hope this is a bit coherent. I had too many things in mind. Yes, I think the last thing I want to say that's important and that my re response to Jan's point about why this is not necessarily a, a philosophical smoke screen. Right. Uh, do we consider the material aspects? Because I find this, and again, I might not be very correct. I don't make myself an expert. I do not presume that I'm expert of European epistemologies, but we are all brought up in European uh, ideas. <laughs> I'm now 53. So if I'm constitutive, if I'm constituted of a lot of these ideas, you would understand. European philosophy often presents himself as immaterial. When I see people conducting European analysis, exegesis, they, when they speak of the material, it's often in regard to the non-European subject. So let's look at the epistemology of war and deterrence. So there is a, there is a philosophical idea that we need to be protected. There's the creation of the enemy, right? Have we considered the material dollars and cents aspect of military production? Because this clearly serves the interest of the establishment. Mm. Somebody is getting tenders and getting contracts. Somebody gets a contract to start a war. They get a contract to rebuild after they destroy the place in the war. They get another contract to start another war. They get another contract to rebuild. They get a contract to deplete all the inventories in Ukraine. They are going to get another contract to replenish the inventories. And I, I find it difficult to believe that those guys who get those contracts do not know that they have to fool people. In one of Jeffrey Sachs' uh, presentations not too long ago, it's when I heard that prior to the invasion of Iraq, the notorious invasion of Iraq, focus groups were conducted to find a way of selling the war as a justified expense and activity by the West. People who would go out and do a focus group, who would select terms carefully, cannot not know. Those they are fooling may not know, but they who do the fooling, it is my considered opinion that to a large extent, they do know what they are saying. Maybe let me stop here. Thank you for that. And John, please, the same open, like feel free to react. Um, I wanted to bring... Um the issue you know back issue back to the question of world order now and it's no longer abstract right um and i spoke about this i mean the rise of the rest this is really obvious and this is unstoppable but the vanguard of this rise is clearly china it's china that's causing the west to lose its mind <laughs> okay <laughs> and there and, and, and really, one has to grasp the scale of the phenomenon of, of Chinese development over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world has never seen anything like this. There's never been anything like this in economic history. Just the number of mm -hmm. people urbanized, uh, raised from poverty, the GDP increase, the industrialization. In fact, actually, on a, on a scale that dwarfs the, the Western Industrial Revolution, none of this is reflected in Western social science. It hasn't caught up with it. You have a social scientific apparatus, speaking of the episteme, 
that is built on European experience and European assumptions and on, on a European data set. It hasn't taken this into account and it psychologically, there's a great difficulty taking it into account. But let's get really concrete about the problem we have right now. So you have this, this phenomenon, you have a, a world order coming to be, we're in this, this famous interregnum, this Gramscian interregnum, but oh, you know what China has has set out, for example, is something utterly concrete. It sound it doesn't you know it's not kumbaya and airy fairy. In fact, what's airy fairy, what lacks specification, what's utterly idealized and abstract, is the existing conception, the Western conception of world order based on deterrence. You have these states that are all black boxes, and then you know they they exist in this sort of balance, ultimately of of terror or fear. But the Chinese want, that's why these initiatives such as the development initiative and the security initiative are side by side with the civilizational initiative. Because this civilizational stuff, again, it sounds like, oh, wow, pretty airy fairy. It isn't. This is what we've been doing right here. This is what you've organized, Pascal. Civilizational dialogue. We're going to need more and more of this. We need voices from the rest of the world to come up. And there's a huge intellectual task, but it's also a social one. We need to start talking. Um, to one another. And I think civilization is a good frame because it stands back and it includes history. It includes these cosmologies. Those are the things that are left out of the types of discussion that you have that, you know, you and I are accustomed to in say a Western seminar where all the assumptions are frankly liberal assumptions. Those don't work anymore. And they certainly don't work for the rest of us. You know, someone like myself, go go, whatever. We we go into this, and we are used to dropping all the rest of that cosmology that we've been talking about. And I appreciate that we're talking about that. We drop the history. We pretend we don't have these things. We know we have this, uh, like Du Bois, du Bois said, this kind of double consciousness. It's time to let go of that, right? So, look, the Chinese one is about constructing peace. About peace, not merely as the absence of war. Mm, right. So exactly. so it, it cannot be just the peace as a result of a deterrence based on fear. That isn't peace in the Chinese conception. So peace as an as a something you construct as an active thing, a set of, of relationships, harmony between people, that needs work. And the work that's going into it, I mean, is, is what's proposed. Whether you can agree or disagree with it, but there is a development initiative which is about ultimately the Chinese perspective view is, look, we realize that our growth is, is a big thing and that in the middle of this, we need to balance our security concerns with global security. That is, of course, peace, the rise of China is disruptive on existing powers, existing orders, or existing order, that it looks frightening from the West, but this needs to be, or it might worry the neighbors, uh, but this needs to be that that this rising this rise needs to be balanced with some kind of you know, um, proposition for the rest of the world. So it's this kind of balance between one's own security and the security of the global community, and the refusal to 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 think of these as two separate things, which is a very common practice in the West. Uh, just just this isolation, this idea of international relations as a separate field where barbarism can can and barbaric considerations can reign, right? So so there is that I think that that balance is very important. And uh, not, from here on, we have to start thinking um, like this. This addresses the the the, the great question Pascal um, set out at the beginning. How is it that you can think of uh, that? You must have an enemy to think of uh, your your own security. Actually, this is a very unnatural way of thinking for for many people around the world. I mean, to this day, China does not talk about the U.S. as the enemy. You don't hear mm -hmm. that. It isn't. China does not have enemies. ASEAN does not have enemies. You have countries that have you know behavior that you might not agree with at a particular time, but until the shooting starts, it's not the enemy. That blanket way of uh, there, there's there's just no need in their uh, in their worldview and in their way of discussing things to think of it like that. But I want to I want to look at the concrete efforts, the development initiative, this massive BRI effort, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative. These all go towards constructing a community, a global community capable of of peace. 
and and the, the, it's wonderful to have three great thinkers like you uh is a, is a great experience the the sad thing is that then the, the hour passes much faster and we're already getting to the end <laughs> um i i would like to ask you again jan agogo and john to each take two minutes to to maybe react to this what i'm gonna ask you but also like wrap up what you what you would like to wrap together and the last thing then is that I agree with you that this is an unnatural way of thinking, that this is a very uh, Euro-American way of thinking, that this is a very colonial way of thinking, and that it doesn't doesn't take into consideration the, the various ways in which the rest of the world is structured. But these people still have the bombs uh, in order to pulverize us all. And if, if, if the only thing you have is a hammer, hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And right now I'm afraid that the Americans and the Europeans keep, keep, keep seeing like nails popping up left and right. Um, Jan, Agogo, John, how do we prevent our Euro-American friends from, from kickstarting what, what is in their epistemology, what would make sense from their, from their point of view of doing, because that's, that's how they have been behaving all, all the way long. How do we prevent this from, uh, from spiraling into the Third World War? Jan first. <laughs> You have you have two minutes. Was did you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two minutes. Please solve the problem. <laughs> well, I would say two things very quickly. Um, one is uh, the West can either explode or implode, and I would not exclude that it will implode, somewhat like the Soviet Union did. You know, the Western brother and now the other Western brother. And secondly, I would say I have always been a staunch believer in not being just critical, but being constructive. That, of course, I have from my mentor, Johan Galton. Don't point to a problem without also saying what could be done about it. And my answer would be also because what politicians are afraid of are better ideas than their, their own. And that's not so difficult to come up with. Whereas criticism is something all politicians live with every day. And that is, of course, alternative defense. It is transarmament to another way of thinking about what defense and security and peace should be. Now, there are tons of theories about that, defensive defense, combinations of military and civilian defense, nonviolent defense, resistance, uh, all kinds of, you know, increasing or decreasing our vulnerability to sanctions and pressures from the outside. There's so We need a whole discussion about what it ought to look like. And that's when I think people will begin to act when they can see it. Uh, I always quote the queen of peace research, Elisa Bowling, who say people will not fight for something they cannot imagine. And therefore, it's our duty as intellectuals to come up with imaginative ideas about what the world could look like and then work for it, rather than just looking at all the problems and saying we're going to hell. I never, I, as a peace, you're not a peace researcher if you accept that. You're not a doctor if you don't have an idea about how to treat the patient and heal the patient. Gogo, your suggestion. You're muted. Yeah. I, I was hoping Jan would solve the problem and then there wouldn't be no, any need to redo it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll just have another discussion about it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my suggestion is uh, for more of what you are doing now, Pascal, um, coming largely from Europe, from, from what you and Jan are doing, and people like Brian. Um, but I really like Jan's idea, so I'll second it. I don't mind seconding an idea. Uh, giving a, a new idea. Uh, very many academics, and even in Africa, they think they can't impact the politicians. I think they're making a significant mistake. If, as an academic, as an intellectual, all you do is repeat what you were told, then all you are going to see is going to be same old. But I think you need, we as academics need to come together more often and be bold enough to come up with new imaginaries. Uh, and it's going to catch the attention of some politicians. Even some of the most diehard mm -hmm. politicians are going to pick some of these ideas and do something about it. So, but I think if you turn your attention, and I think that's what you're doing, actually, both of you, uh, you may not use those terms, but you are decolonizing Western ways of thinking, received, entrenched Western ways of thinking. I think that's crucial. And the ordinary European, I know there's no ordinary person, 
has to understand that it's not working anymore, as John said. Maybe they need to understand all the measures of attempted containment of China. They didn't work. They won't work. They need to know the number of sanctions that has been placed on Russia. They didn't work. They won't work. I think you need to bring this home to European publics and European intellectuals. Then the need, the compelling need for a new reaction, the, the case would be laid for that. And then who knows what's going to come up. New ideas would come up and I think we could avoid uh, the Armageddon. Thank you. I hope so. John, the final word goes to you. Thank you. I, I share your, your concern. Uh, I share your, your perspective and, and your worry. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like having a guy with a suicide vest on and coaxing him down. So, you know, it feels more and more like uh, Western uh, therapeutics right now than what the rest of us need to do. You know, as Gogo mm -hmm. was saying, is look, you have to calm this. Uh, you, know, you have to calm this lunatic down and persuade them. Look, it uh, it doesn't work. You are hurting yourself. Yeah, quite literally. For example, I mean, they're going to find that these uh, technology restrictions on China don't work. Completely counterproductive. In fact strengthen China in ways that terrify them even more, right? Sanctions, um, when, you are, when you're the smaller part of the global economy, what you're doing with the sanction is you're cutting yourself off. So the, I mean, I think I have a pretty grim view of it. I, I, you know, I, I, to, be, to be realistic, I think we're in for a really bad time because yeah, you have this guy with a suicide vest on or you have a guy with a hammer and that's all he has and he's in a corner. I think there's hope in the fact that um, actually, the liberal I, I, consensus, the ideology out of which, um, which out of which this ontology of violence comes, it's crumbling at home. It's actually, I think, also declining, eroding uh, pre precipitously in, in in the West, and you see this, and I think that's that's one of the things that, that that's manifesting itself in outcomes such as November six in the in, in the U.S. Uh, elections the rise of these uh, populists. You know, whatever Trump does, it's what the American public, it's how they voted is really interesting. And you're going to see this across the West. <laughs> in uh, I don't have to say in Germany, uh, UK, France, etc. cetera. Um, the, the liberal elite, which operate on these assumptions to whom this kind of violence is, is natural, uh, I think they're really losing ground. So there's some hope in this collapse of this ideology. Now, in the middle of that collapse, this is when the work of intellectuals or the work of imagining something new actually has some uh, impact, a greater impact. And I think that's the space in which we might be able to do something. And I agree, actually, Pascal is actually a very, very important um, person in this, in, in the work that, that you do. And in bringing people together and, and conducting these, the, these conversations, we need to do a lot uh, more of this. But my hope is actually, and I, I see a thought, sort of uh, collapse happening, and uh, hopefully the uh, um, uh, these elites are turfed out, actually, before, uh, before they do more harm. Beautiful, Thank beautiful way of structuring it. Thank you for your for your nice words and, and the compliments as well. And what I take away from this discussion is that what we have to do, and also everybody listening, we have to make it crumble faster. <laughs> 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 and do your discussions left and right, right? And and help 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 that system to crumble in a in a way that, that the better the better core comes to shine because we have yeah. better cores. Yeah. Um very true. My friend. Thank you very much for your time today, you. and we'll talk next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.